Welcome everybody to the third installation of Marsh Watch. It's going to be our second bird ID session. And by request, today I'm also going to be covering a few common wetland plants. So before we get started, I just want to let you know that I am broadcasting today from Saskatoon, which is located on Treaty 6 territory, encompassing the traditional lands of the Cree, Dakota, Soto, and Stony First Nations, as well as the homeland of the Métis. If you are tuning in for the first time, my name is Leanne Lactramoy, and I have the pleasure of working for an organization called Birds Canada. Um, we're a not-for-profit charitable organization, and our mission is to drive action to increasing understanding, appreciation, and conservation of birds in Canada. And this program here really hits on those first two, that increasing the under understanding and appreciation. Um, I myself am rather fond of wetlands, as you can see from this collage of photos. I have found myself in a variety of wetland habitats, you know, throughout my, you know, almost 15 years in, in biology. And wetlands are some of my favorite places to be. I like to just muck around in them, hear the birds, you know. I don't really like getting bit by mosquitoes, but you can't really avoid that in most places anyway. So hopefully um, you're going to enjoy this journey with us. Today we're going to be talking about a few species of birds as well as one frog. And I have put together some Wetland Plants 101. These are going to be some of the just the more common species. It is by no means an exhaustive list. All of that is going to be recorded and posted online. So in case you ever want to go back or um, if you want to share it with a friend, by all means do that. Then afterwards, I'm going to stop recording, we're going to do some quizzes, and we'll have a little bit of discussion period, and yeah, that'll be that'll be it for the evening. Okay, so the birds that we're going to be covering today, we've got Northern Pintail, American Coot, we've got two Grebes, Redneck and pie Build, we've got Killdeer, American Avocet, and Blackneck Stilt as some shorebirds, and we'll also cover the Northern Leopard Frog. So... Without further ado, let's get on to this very classy looking duck. It is an early spring migrant. There are northern pintails around, so if you're on the prairies and you want to go check them out right now, you can. So this is a rather large dabbler. It's kind of medium to large. Very slender and long-necked. This is just a, a, an incredibly elegant duck. It's got very fine, lovely proportions. The drake has this beautiful elongated tail, hence the name pintail. It's got this nice brown, plain brown head, and the neck kind of goes up and projects a white little spur along both sides of the neck. And as we've talked about before, when we're looking at ducks, especially if they're on the water and at any distance away, that white spur is really, you know, or the white in general is really going to stand out at a distance. Sometimes, you know, depending on the lighting conditions, most of the colors can be kind of muddled and hard to see, but Anything that's white really stands out, especially in low light conditions. So if you ever, you know, see a nice looking duck out on the pond and it's got white all along its neck and going up on a spur, you're going to be sure that that is a northern pintail drake. Otherwise, a little bit of white on the breast, breast kind of grayish sides. It's actually, you know, variegated black and white feathers or gray and white feathers, and it really looks gray at any sort of distance. And kind of got this like sleek black and blue bill. There's like kind of this blue along the side of it and dark down the center. Very, very classy looking duck. Um, the speculum, which is that colored patch on the wings that we're seeing here. In males, it's kind of green and it's bronzy. In males, it's green. In the females, it's a bit more bronzy. And depending on um, you know, the bird, both of those stripes can either be white or more often you'll have a bit of that kind of beigey color that we often refer to in the birding world as buffy. Um, Buffy's kind of that just beigey, warm, pale tone. So that is our lovely, handsome drake. That nice long tail is going to really stick out and especially again that neck and just the overall really elegant proportions. It kind of looks like a swan in terms of how long-necked and elegant it looks. The hens, I think, are also quite attractive. They're rather plain. Um, also has that kind of slender, long-necked lo long look to it. Overall, mottled brown like all of our dabbling hens, but she's going to have a very plain face. 
And what always stands out for me is the warmer tones on the face compared to the rest of the body. You can really see it in this one in flight here. The, that warm brown coloration on the head looks a lot warmer brown than say a bit more of the, the cooler brown tones on the body. So very, very plain face, nice dark bill. She's also got dark legs. And that just that plain, plain face that is warm or brown, that is going to be the thing that sticks out. Um, oftentimes, they'll be in the company of males, especially this time of year. Again, those same kind of elegant, slender proportions. And proportions, those are some of those things that, you know, you wind up getting better at the more you're looking at, you know, different ducks. Some of them will look stockier. Others will have, you know, this kind of nice shape to their, their head and necks and the northern pintail is one that eventually you'll be able to to look at and say, oh, it's got these really slender proportions, quite a long neck for the most part. And then you hone in on some of those finer details. You can take a look at that speculum here. It's bronzy, sometimes a bit of a green sheen to it. And you can see sometimes that it has a little bit of that white on those edging feathers on the top. Below, it's always white, generally speaking, but on the top here, it can either be a little bit of a buffy color or it can be white. So that is our northern pintail hen, quite a handsome little lady. This is a dabbling species, so they're going to be feeding at the surface, and they're pretty generalist. They'll eat seeds and grain, tubers, vegetative parts of aquatic plants, and like pretty much anything, it's going to eat some invertebrates because generally everything needs protein, you know, to create more body mass and especially, um, you know, little, little ducklings as they're growing, they need a heck of a lot of protein. So they'll also eat a lot of invertebrates. So insects, snails, crustaceans, and earthworms. You're going to find northern pintails in kind of shallow wetlands and open country. This is definitely a prairie duck species. They really like kind of open grassy areas. And they make this really interesting little call. They do kind of these like toot toot noises, the males anyway, the drakes, and kind of overlaid with that, there's these kind of tent zipper sounds. It's not something that you're going to hear necessarily a ton of, or it's not going to be super distinctive. So for the most part, focus on visual ID for this species, but it's always nice to learn what these birds sound like. So here we're going to hear those toots and tent zipper sounds. I don't know if you could hear that, that kind of z z. It sounds like somebody's like, you know, opening and closing a, a, a zipper really fast on a tent. I'll play it once more, those toots and those tent zipper noises. It's not a sound that I hear a ton of. I've heard it a few times on recordings of, of wetlands at night and it's it's just not super common, but always good to have in the back pocket. In flight, these guys actually have kind of a distinctive flight shape with that long kind of elongated neck and especially the drakes with that nice tail. They're often referred to as lawn darts. Um, if you've ever <laughs> seen lawn, dart, lawn darts, those have since been banned for, for a long time. But basically, you know, if you tried to shoot this dart on a lawn into, into a hoop, um, but they, they have a similar shape to them, that kind of, you know, bill that sticks out, there's a head, there's a long neck, followed by, you know, kind of a aerodynamic chunky body followed by a long tail on the end. So they do have a bit of a unique light silhouette. That was how we, you know, knew that some of them were, were in town. We were driving um, along the highway and you could just, you know, see them fly by and they just have, you know, a distinct shape. And don't worry if you find bird shapes confusing at first. I, I certainly thought it was, you know, black magic that the first person I learned birds from in the field was identifying all kinds of black birds. And there's a grackle, there's a starling, there's a red-winged blackbird. And they were just, to me, black birds flying in the sky. So don't, don't worry if that kind of stuff doesn't resonate right away with you but just just know that eventually you might be able to start telling these guys apart by by their flight silhouettes oops there we go and northern pintails have quite a wide range um as i mentioned they're fairly common here out on the prairies especially in kind of those areas where you don't have a lot of shrubs around they really like that kind of open grassy country and let's compare the hens that we 
saw last week. So all three of these are going to be kind of in the medium to large size. We've got the Mallard, Northern Shoveler, and Northern Pintail that we've covered so far. The Northern Pintail is going to stand out from these two in that she's going to have this nice dark bill. It's going to, you know, not really look like a giant kazoo or a shoehorn stuck onto it like the Northern Shoveler. Northern Shoveler is going to have this kind of orange and olive spatulate bill that just is really oversized for, for what the bird's head is. And the Mallard is going to have a more typical, you know, duck-shaped bill, orange with a dark center, whether that's kind of speckled patterns or, you know, a darker saddle across it. The speculums are going to be different. Mallard's going to have blue with those white borders above and below. Uh, the Northern Shoveler is going to have a green speculum with a white border above, and the speculum is going to be bronzy with a white or buffy border in the Northern Pintail. In terms of looking at the face, the Mallard is going to have a bit stronger of an eye line, and the head is gener generally going to be a cooler brown than the rest of the body. In the Northern Shoveler, the hen is kind of nondescript, similar tone to the head and the body. Really, it's going to be that big honking bill that's going to be your dead giveaway for your northern shoveler. And the northern pintail is going to have kind of a plain face, which is going to be warmer toned brown than the rest of the body. There's not really going to be any eye line per se, but you'll often see that darker, richer brown tone on the face than the body. And I've mentioned you know, that before that dabblers often have this kind of modeled coloration. I just want to pull up here um, dabbler hens versus our diving hens. And dabblers, they're really the ones that are, you know, built for nesting on land. They can walk around really good, as we've discussed. They have these great broad wings that they can, you know, fly from a standstill. They can fly from land. But the coloration here really you know, sets the two apart. So in the dabbler hens, they're mottled brown overall in the body feathers, and the diver hens tend to be more plain and more uniform in their in terms of their body coloration. This is because the dabbler hens are going to be nesting in the upland, so they want to blend into kind of all of that upland vegetation and grassy stuff. So they've got all of these kind of intricately, intricately colored, you know, body and back feathers. The diver hens are generally going to be nesting either right above water or next to it, or there's a few species that are cavity nesters where it's it's going to be less of a big deal. They're not trying to hide quite so much. So they're, overall, they look a bit darker and plainer. They don't have that intricate modeling pattern. So that can just be another quick way to separate your dabbling hens from your diving hens. And that just gives you a quick way to, okay, I need to go to this section of my field guide in order to try to figure out which hen you have. So don't worry, we're going to do a great big review at the end of the program and we'll go over all of this again. But I just thought I'd bring this up now because we've talked mostly about dabblers and we haven't talked about the diver so much, but I just wanted to make that little distinction there. Okie doke. Next up, we have the American Coot. This is a rail, much like the Sora, except that it acts a whole lot more like a duck than it does a secretive rail. It's going to be fairly large, and it's going to be bold. Essentially, it acts like a giant water chicken. Um, they're, they're bold, they're kind of aggressive. Both sexes look the same. They're going to be kind of this black, maybe you can call it a dark gray. I always think of it as kind of a, a jet black coloration all over. They've got these white little tail feathers and they've got this bright white bill. It's got a little bit of a reddish tip, a little bit of a ring around the end, and they actually have this little shield on their forehead that's kind of usually a, a nice dark deep red. Most of these birds, you'll find them in wetlands that have water. They're really kind of gregarious. You'll often see lots of them in an area. And, you know, they're not ducks. They don't have webbed feet like ducks do. They're, they are a rail species, but what they've done is that they've developed these interesting little lobes on their feet so they can float around on the open water and paddle around. So it's a rail that kind of looks and acts a lot more like a duck. But you can notice it, it doesn't have that kind of duck bill, right? It has a bit more of that sharp pointy one, much like the Sora had. It's going to be common, like I said, in most wetlands. And they're quite noisy. They make a variety of noises. Um, you know, they make popping noises and hiccup noises. And I'll play that for you now just so you can hear it. They're, they're often quite chatty in the marsh. I, I, I do love those noises, all of those popping ones. I'll play it again.
oftentimes, you know, you'll you'll hear a bit of those noises before you actually see the birds, and you know, eventually one will turn the corner in the marsh and will will come out. Um, I mentioned that they can be quite aggressive. They do get into a lot of territorial disputes. Um, <laughs> sometimes they'll get right back onto their backs and they'll have these sort of kicking matches at each other. And it is just absolutely hysterical. Um, before it escalates to that extent, they'll often do some displays where they kind of arch their, their wings up, put their necks down, and they'll fan out their white tail feathers. And... I've often seen this kind of, you know, trying to de-escalate a situation or, you know, they've gotten a little uppity and then they're, you know, they're doing this kind of white tail display and they'll go their go their own ways. So they're they're quite interesting little birds. Their chicks are something you either think are absolutely adorable or you think they're pretty hideous. They're, you know, black with this kind of yellowish red fuzz in places they've got a bald head that's quite red their little beak is is red as well and they do a whole lot of begging um and you may have heard about this before but coots can be kind of nasty towards little ones sometimes coots do lay a whole lot of eggs and they will also lay eggs into you know the the nests of other coots they'll try to spread them around but Coot parents are actually pretty good at picking out which eggs are theirs or not, or which chicks are theirs or not, and they are ruthless. Um, they will peck and pester, you know, unwanted or, you know, uh, interloper chicks to death. They sometimes are quite aggressive in the pecking, or they'll just completely refuse to feed them. And, you know, this is nature. They're, not all of their kids are going to survive. And if it's a tough year, um, they might also do this to some of their own chicks that are weaker, and they'll just favor the, the stronger chicks. So beware, you might see some nasty coot parental behavior, and it can be it can be a little bit shocking the first time you come across it. But it all of it is a, a strategy for, you know, the best chances at survival and, and passing along their genes and having some of their own kids survive. So that's kind of the background as to why coots might get a, a bad rap as parents. They kind of are. They're not always the greatest. They like to, to feed at the surface. They're not really going to be diving underwater too, too much. They often peck and dabble at stuff. They'll eat plant matter and they'll eat invertebrates. Um, oftentimes when they're, you know, in the breeding season trying to lay a lot of eggs or they're feeding their young or the young are feeding themselves it's often going to be things that are high in protein like insects and mollusks and crustaceans but year-round they'll also eat things like pond weeds sedges algae and grasses kind of, they've got quite a, a wide range in north america so this is a, a rail that you're likely to see across a fair bit of north america <clears throat> okay Next up, we have a couple of grebe species, and I'll just introduce the grebes generally first. These guys are expert divers. Like we talked about um, the diving ducks having their feet far back on their body. Grebes take that, you know, to a, to a greater degree. Their feet are so far back on their body that they are, you know, pretty useless at getting around on land. They're, they're similar to a loon in that regard. The feet are really far back on their body. And that's just for, you know, the best ability for propulsion. They've got quite pointed bills and they generally have very reduced tail feathers. I like to call them fluffy bums because if you get a look at their posterior and it's out of the water, it is mostly just fluff. There's a couple of reduced tail feathers there. Um, so it really kind of just looks like they're they're missing a tail completely. Um, grebes are interesting in that they will consume their own body feathers and parents will pick off body feathers and feed them to their kids. And it's not entirely clear why they do that, but the best theory going is that they do this to line their stomach because they do eat a lot of fish. And this, you know, is thought to help slow down the passage of bones into other portions of the digestive tract. So it's thought that, you know, those feathers help to create a little bit of a barrier and keep the fish bones in the stomach dissolving in the acids a little bit longer to help soften them up. That's the going theory. Unfortunately, we can't really ask the grebes, hey, why do you eat feathers? This is just the best idea that we have. Um, young are brooded on their backs, so you'll often see them carrying around their little guys, and it is absolutely adorable. And they often engage in really elaborate courtship rituals involving, you know, synchronized movements, um, gathering 
vegetation from the bottom of the lake and you know they'll preen each other and it's just it's they're really incredible to watch in the breeding season so we'll cover two species today and the first is the red-necked grebe it's a fairly large grebe it's very conspicuous it is loud it is long-necked this isn't a grebe that's going to like to hide away necessarily you'll you'll see these guys out on the open water the sexes look the same um and Kind of the, one of that feature that stands out at a distance is that shiny gray cheek patch. It's the lightest part on the grebe, and that cheek patch really does just kind of stand out from a great distance. Otherwise, they've got this nice red neck, an overall dark body, this kind of dark cap to their heads, and this yellowish, darkish bill. It's quite long. It's quite pointy, um, really great for catching fish. You'll see these in large wetlands um, with open water and emergent vegetation. You'll also see them on the edges of larger lakes where there's little cattails and stuff sticking out. And here's an adorable picture on the bottom left here of, you know, a parent carrying around a bunch of their little green babies. Um, the babies often have these little striped looks. It, it almost, it always looks to me like they're wearing little striped pajamas. So I just think they are absolutely adorable. Um, they got little red markings on their face so that the parents, you know, know where to put the food. And yeah, they're just cute as a button little babies. Redneck grebes are quite loud. And because they tend to nest on large water bodies, as you know, as you might know, uh, sound travels really great over water because it just it bounces along the surface and gets carried. It doesn't get absorbed by anything. So you can often hear these guys from, from you know, the other side of a fairly decently large lake. So they sound like they're kind of whinnying or braying. Um, I kind of imagine a cartoon stereotypical, maybe, you know, rednecky type, like kind of doing this crazy laughter. So listen to that. And they'll often do this together, that a pair will get duetting. I'll play it once more for you. So it is quite the cacophony of redneck grebe noises. And like I said, that can travel a great distance on an open body of water. Um, and you'll often get several pairs, especially if the, if the body of water is big enough. So it can be quite noisy sometimes. They're pretty opportunistic when it comes to feeding. Um, you know, they, they do dive, so they, and they have that fish eating bill, so they'll eat fish, crustaceans, aquatic insects, and aquatic larvae. They'll also eat amphibians if they can get them. And they often do these really, you know, elaborate courtship displays. Um, they'll do the discovery ceremony, and that's the part of the picture that you're seeing there with those the head feathers just, you know, fluffed up, kind of looking like cat ears. They'll do a weed ceremony where they'll dive underwater and present you know, nesting material to each other. It's like, look at all the, you know, plants I can gather to build our great nest. Um, and they'll also do some greeting ceremonies. And you can see here on the bottom in the center, um, just how awkward they are on land. So they kind of waddle up their nest and their nest is a pretty soggy mass of vegetation that's piled up from the bottom of the wetland and you know making this kind of wet soggy pile that the adults can kind of trundle onto and incubate their little nests they, they look kind of funny especially when you see them out of water and you can see just how big their body is and how slender of a neck they have i always think they look rather silly when they're sitting on a nest and here's just some of the examples of you know their courtship rituals they'll do all these discovery ceremonies they've got a cat display where they'll hunch their their feathers up and push their little head feathers up you know the, the my favorite um is the ghostly penguin display that just has the best name ever and they'll that's where they'll stand up and kind of greet each other and they'll do little penguin dances and they'll rush along um i highly recommend just googling um grebe 
uh, mating ceremonies is just they're absolutely hysterical to watch. And in terms of range, it's more of a central and western species. So um, you might see them out east in the winter time, but generally speaking, we've got them out here in the breeding season on the prairies and farther west. Okay, our next grebe is the pied billed grebe, so called for its pied bill, its multicolored bill. Um, so it's comparatively, it's it's much more small and it is much more compact. Where the redneck grebe had this like you know long slender neck and it was fairly large, the pied bill grebe is you know small. It is stocky. It's kind of got a blocky head shape to it. Both sexes again look the same. They're kind of this dark gray brown overall and they're often wet because these guys spend a lot of time under the water they have a distinct thick bill which is whitish kind of almost has a blue gray cast to it but overall kind of white is whitish and it has that nice dark ring around it that really stands out at a distance as well as that kind of ring that connects to the bill right around the eye there Otherwise, they've got a dark chin and a little bit of a, you know, dark mask around a bit of their face. And this is a very secretive grebe, so you're more often going to hear it than, than you see it. One of my favorite things that they do is they're capable of adjusting how much air is captured in their feathers and adjusting their buoyancy. They're secretive, they don't like people watching them, and they'll often, you know, slowly go under the water surface, or quickly, and then they'll slowly emerge, like you can see this little guy in the bottom left here, and they'll sometimes they'll slowly come up, they'll look around, like, ah, oh, that lady's still there with the binoculars, and then they'll swim under, and they're capable of going great distances underwater and staying underwater for quite a bit of time. So you may see it at first at, you know, one corner of the wetland if there's a bunch of open water and, you know, eventually you're noticing that it's calling from, you know, way elsewhere in the marsh. They will try to avoid you as much as possible for the most part. They'll dive under and then they'll come up at various locations just to, you know, peek their eyes out to check if you're still there. Um, so kind of call this the the submarine um or at least i call it the submarine they kind of slowly sink and then they'll slowly come back up and decide if you know the coast is clear or not these guys you'll find them in wetlands with emergent vegetation and open water deep enough for diving this isn't going to be a grebe that you'll find in any sort of you know choked out wetland they definitely need open water and stuff for diving um, because it is a grebe and they do like fish Another opportunistic diver, fish, crustaceans, aquatic insects and larvae, leeches, and amphibians. Their young also have the striped pajama look, definitely a bit more, you know, restricted to the head for the most part, but some of their bodies can also be striped as well. And here you can really see that dark chin standing out, but really kind of dark brownish gray blocky grebe. And the the calls that they make also travel quite a good distance. So there's two common ones, the owl hoop call, and this kind of varying degrees of, um, it can go on for, for longer or shorter, depending on what the bird seems to feel like doing. So take a listen to the owl hoop call. So for those longer calls, it almost feels like the bird is getting tired of giving its call and it's getting slower and lower, but they can give, you know, just portions of that. I'll play it once more. This is the owl hoop call. The other one that they commonly do is called the hyena, and it sounds a lot like laughter, and they'll often do this as a pair, so you'll get one that starts and then the other one chimes in somewhere nearby. So here's the hyena laughing call. <laughs> Play that one again. This is just one bird going in the hyena call. Oops. Oh, come on. Right. 
We'll go over these calls again at the end, but that is the Pi Build Grieve call. And as well, it also has a variety of dances. Um, and I just love the names that, you know, biologists gave to them, the triumph ceremony and the rigid pointing down posture. So all that to say is they have a lot of stereotypical or, or you know, um, stereotyped displays that they do towards each other to, you know, start a pair bond and reinforce that pair bond. Greaves are just really adorable that way. Quite a wide ranging species. You're going to see this um, grebe across North America over much of it, as well as South and Central America. So quite widespread. <clears throat> okay, another early harbinger of spring. We've got the killdeer up next. So this is a pretty small shorebird. It's in the plover family. It's got a little short, straight bill, long tail, and kind of a pigeon like head. It's quite rounded and has that kind of stubby little bill on the end. Um, I see I've removed the S here, but both sexes <laughs> look the same. We've got this kind of solid brown coloration above, white below, and they have this lovely double breast band. And those bands kind of continue on to the face a little bit. There's one right above the eyes on the forehead, and then one that kind of goes across the bill. And I like to think of this bird as if you were to see it head on, it might look like a target. So kill deer. I always made that association with the target and the name kill deer. They've got this lovely rusty rump, which we'll look at in a second here, and that's seen during a distraction display, which we'll talk about. They've got a nice lovely little eye ring that is red in color. <clears throat> and this is a bird that you're going to find, you know, throughout the prairie provinces and throughout much of North America, um, in fields, mud flats, lawns, gravel parking lots, kind of anywhere that is going to be kind of flat open and usually within some vicinity of some water. They're quite tolerant of humans, um, you know, to, to the point where it's a little bit um, dangerous for them. They will nest in gravel parking lots. I go, oh, this is a lovely spot. Maybe they, you know, pick it when people aren't necessarily parking there too much, but later in the season when people come out and say, hey, I want to go to the beach, um, their nests are at risk because they just lay these four little eggs in, it doesn't even look like anything, you would never find it. <laughs> I'll show you in the, the next slide here. So the, the center and the bottom here, those are some killdeer eggs and they are almost impossible to find on their own in a gravel pit. However, the parents do this incredible distraction display. So you can see here in the top, the, the bird is showing this nice rusty rump and they'll do this kind of broken wing display. And what they're doing is they're trying to lead predators away from their young or their nest. And they'll do this with like, hey, I'm I'm easy prey. I'm so wounded. See, my, my wing is broken. And they'll do this whole display of drooping their one wing, acting like, you know, they're, they're semi-injured. And they'll keep doing this. They'll just be leading you further and further away from, you know, either their young or their eggs, depending on what stage their kids are at. And eventually when they've deemed that, you know, they've led you far enough away, they'll stop the act and they will fly off, um, you know, because they, they were never at risk. But they're trying to trick the predator into thinking that they're an easy meal and that just kind of distracts a predator and gets them away from their nest. Shorebird babies, especially plovers, I think are just some of the most adorable little creatures are kind of, you know, miniature versions of their parents. They're born, you know, almost ready to run immediately. And they kind of just look like, you know, cotton balls with toothpicks for legs. So baby plovers and, and shorebirds in general are just absolutely adorable. They eat all kinds of things. They chase, they probe. Um, if they're in little mud flats, they'll do a little bit of foot tapping to entice little bugs and stuff to come to the surface and they'll peck at those. So they eat uh, all kinds of terrestrial invertebrates, including earthworms, insects and their larvae, especially grasshoppers and beetles that also feed on snails. And they think seeds and aquatic invertebrates are also pretty tasty. Now, the reason they're called killdeer is not because they have a target on their head. It's actually, it's the mnemonic for the way the bird sounds. So here's their killdeer call. And this is likely something that if you're going outside this time of year, you're going to be hearing potentially plenty of this killdeer, killdeer call. They are quite vocal and quite loud. <laughs> and 
and they'll just keep going and going, especially if you're, you know, out there, say you're doing a survey at a specific location and you've ticked off the local killdeer, they'll just be flying around saying killdeer, killdeer, killdeer um, all the time that you're there. I'll play it once more. So you can see <clears throat> the the killdeer's call is where it got its name. <clears throat> Definitely a widespread species in Canada and the US in terms of breeding and year round in some of the southern US. Okay, we have another fabulous looking shorebird. This one's going to be a prairie specialty. This is the American Avocet. It's quite a large shorebird. Both sexes look pretty much the same. There's a difference in the curvature of the bill. It's more curved in females, but otherwise both sexes do have a very long, very thin, slightly upturned bill. They've got a nice long neck and they've got these incredibly long bluish looking legs. They're, they're quite striking if you see them. Both sexes, otherwise they have this kind of rusty salmon wash on the head and neck and on their back and wings is kind of this bold black and white pattern and on a, the rest of the body is fairly white. That bold black and white and that lovely salmon wash on the head makes it a fairly distinct shorebird. You'll find these birds in shallow ephemeral wetlands, so things that they can wade around in. They really like to walk around and pick, you know, little bits of vegetation and little bits of insects and stuff. So, you know, shallow ephemeral wetlands, saline wetlands, and the shallows of larger wetland systems because, you know, sometimes there's a shallow marshy bit in, in a larger pond. So that's where you'll find these guys walking around and they'll swish the water in the bill and, you know, they'll also pick in the sediment. They're looking for invertebrates. They're also looking for aquatic plant seeds and they'll even take small fish if they're small enough and they can get them. As I mentioned before, shorebird babies are adorable and um, the bottom left here, you can see a baby American Avocet. They will occasionally get out into deeper water and do a little bit of paddling or kind of very deep wading, but oftentimes you'll often see them more, you know, on the shores or in the shallows, with a little bit of their legs exposed. They do have a bit of a unique call, but you know, if you're just learning your birds, this might be a little bit of a tougher one to write to the hard drive. So. You can focus on visual ID. This isn't a secretive marsh bird in any way. This kind of just lets you know that maybe over yonder there's going to be an American avocet. So here is their pleek, pleek, pleek call. And you can find them often in, in quite large groups. Um, so you can imagine lots of pleeking going on sometimes. So here's that pleeking call again. But this is definitely a bird that you're going to want to focus, you know, most of your attention on the visual ID. They're, like I said, they're not very secretive and they're, they stand out pretty well. Oh, that is the American Avocet. As I mentioned, it's far more of a, you know, kind of central and prairie specialty. So you might have to come out for a visit um, to the prairies if you want to see this, if you don't live in their range. Another one that is similar looking to the American Avocet in terms of structure is the black necked stilt. Black -necked stilt. Um, as you can see though, it is a very black and white bird, medium shore bird, both sexes look the same, but it's got a needle-like straight bill, quite long neck, and these incredibly long bubblegum pink legs. They're just really neat looking legs. Um, again, that kind of black and white coloration. They're a little bit of a brown tinge to the black in the females, but otherwise very similar. The white below, and they have this nice white kind of eyebrow patch. But really, you know, black and white bird on bubblegum pink legs is going to stand out incredibly. Um, you know, they don't they don't blend into the background in any way. They're they're quite obvious. You'll find them um, in shallow ephemeral wetlands, saline wetlands, the shallows of larger wetlands. I've actually seen them nesting in ditches. Um, so you know, any kind of shallow wetland that has a lot of emergent vegetation where they can kind of you know make a little nest in. Um, they do tend to like to nest in more vegetation than the American avocets do. 
they pick their picker, they'll wander around and get invertebrates, they'll eat insects, larvae, and crustaceans, they'll pick up small fish, and they will also eat frogs if they're small enough and they can get them. So you'll often see them waiting in the shallows again. Um, they do make kind of a yap, yap, yap call, but again, you know, they're not a secretive bird. They're, you're going to really be focusing more on the visual ID for the species. So here is what they sound like. Yep, 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 yep. Play that once more. And you may be noticing that there's also some stilt chicks here. They're shorebird chicks are really good at having this kind of camouflaged pattern on them. And it it always looks funny to me when these guys get down to, you know, brood their young or sit on their nest. They they're, they're just their legs are impossibly long and it looks absolutely silly um and i've got an, another series in this photo here where the parent is actually brooding their young so they'll you know let the chicks come in and get warm under all of those nice little feathers so it's just absolutely hilarious to see all of these little legs stuck out from from under the shorebird's belly i'll just go back oops you can see little guys out and about maybe like hey I'd like to I'd like to get warm under here and then crawling in and getting nice and cozy um, under the parent so pretty cute little birds and interestingly enough um, if you look at most range maps you're gonna say what the heck why are we talking about this in this prairie wetland you know talk well they have been increasing on the prairies, and we have had them nesting across a fair bit of Saskatchewan. Um, during the Breeding Bird Atlas, we recorded a bunch of them nesting. Um, so they have infiltrated, you know, the, the you know Alberta and Saskatchewan, a little bit of Manitoba to some extent, but they're increasingly common um, on the prairies in the last like 10, 15 years or so. And, you know, some birds just keep moving and exploiting new habitats and you know, you get a little bit of a vanguard coming in, the bird survives a season or, or two, and eventually more more follow it. So it's always interesting to see some of those range shifts. Nope, oh, black neck still, it's not going to show up in your field guide as something that, that occurs on the prairies here, but rest assured, you, you do have a good chance of seeing them, especially, you know, in Alberta and in western Saskatchewan here. Okay. We are at our leopard frog, our frog for the evening. So this is a fairly large one. Last week we spoke about a couple of, you know, relatively small little frogs. So about 11 centimeters, it's four and one third inches. And again, body color on these frogs often ranges between individuals. So some of them are gonna be green, brown, more kind of yellowish colored, more bronzy. But the thing that is gonna be you know, what you're going to be looking for in the northern leopard frog. It's going to have these lovely spots and they're going to be bordered by a lighter kind of faint ring. Um, those of you who may have been in the path of the total eclipse might find this familiar looking, this black spot with this kind of halo around it. So you can imagine those as little solar eclipse spots on the northern leopard frog. Um, we'll find these guys in the western boreal in the prairie um, where they're special concern, but across other places they're they're not um, a species at risk yet so what they sound like is i i think it sounds like two balloons sort of rubbing together so here's a call of the northern leopard frog So a little bit like rubbing balloons together, maybe that brody thing that, you know, young kids seem to like to do that noise. So that is our northern leopard frog. I'll play the call once more. Yeah. Kind of reminiscent of a stomach growl as I'm seeing in the chat. So again, 
quite spotty and it has that you know pale halo around the the darker spots on the frog's body so that is our northern leopard frog okay now i have added some common wetland plants this is going to be by no means an extensive list of all of the wetland plants we're just mostly going to be focusing on different types of them so mostly looking at genus level but all of these plants they're you know they're adapted to wet environments and they're tolerant to flooding to varying degrees some of them you know in order to survive and have a long you know establishment they need a fair bit of water you know they like to generally be flooded some of them can tolerate a bit of flooding so you know water in the early season that dries out this is kind of the habitat that some of them like but all to varying degrees they're they're adapted to wetland habitats and environments so you're going to be hearing me mentioning a few of these species in the presentation so by request we're going to be going over some of them the first up is cattails. Um, this is in the genus Typha. There's at least two species and they do hybridize. So we're, we're not even going to consider that. We're just going to call them all cattails. Um, they're, the leaves and stems, they're quite flattened. They're broad and they're bright green. They have many leaves per plant that grow from the base and they can be quite tall. They can go from about five feet tall to 10 feet tall. So you can see um, my lovely field partners here at the bottom, some of them in quite deep water with quite tall cattails um, versus, you know, cattails that are in a basin that is a bit more drawn down. Maybe they don't get as tall. Um, Danica is not a very tall person. So, you know, about five feet tall um, cattails in that photo. And the thing that's going to really, you know, stand out is it looks like a bit of a, a brown corn dog on a stick. That's the flower part. Um, the previous season's flowers are going to kind of fluff up. They'll be used for nesting material. Um, there are little tiny seeds attached to all those bits of fluff, so some of the birds are going to also be snacking on those seeds, but the previous season's, you know, flowers are going to be all fluffy and puffed out, so that's what we're going to be seeing at this time of year. There isn't really going to be any green growth yet, but once the leaves start growing, eventually you'll you'll get those kind of flower stalks with that you know, corn dog on a stick look to them. You can find them in deeper, shallow water. And what's interesting is they'll also form these floating mats, which I have had some experience on. They can be quite terrifying. They can, you know, be floating over many feet of water and they'll just be having this giant root mass and you walk around on it and it just kind of floats. And <laughs> you see these cattails bending in the water. So they can form these huge, you know, floating mats um, that can, some of them can, break off and actually form floating islands. I've seen that before. Um, and oftentimes they're going to be forming these large monoculture stands. So it's not just, it's, not, it's often not just like one or two cattails that you'll see in a wetland. You'll see this great big patch of them. So that is the cattail. That is the typha species. Another deep water plant are the bulrushes. These used to be in the genus Scirpus, but they, um, the whole... Uh, family of sedges has been under a fair bit of revision. So now they're in the Chenoplectus genus. Um, these are going to be, you know, spikes essentially growing out of the ground. They're dark green. They are round in cross section. If you break one apart, you'll find that they've got this kind of neat spongy center. And it's essentially a single spiked stalk. There's kind of very reduced sheath leaves at the very bottom, but it really just looks like this really big, long spike that is kind of growing out of the wetland. I have these tassely looking flowers near the, te near the tip of like the, the stalk or the leaf. So you can see here this lovely little wren sitting on the flowery bits of this bulrush and they can get quite large um three to ten feet tall and you can see in this photo here the stems can be quite thick and you know they're they're dark and they're round they like deep water a bit deeper than cattails even and they too will form these large monoculture stands so those are the bulrushes Another one that likes that can handle deep water, but often um, you find growing in shallower water is the common reed, um, also known as Phragmites. This is a this is an actual grass, so it it has that kind of grass like habit. The the bright green leaves are you know lovely when fresh, and it can be very very tall. It can grow up to twenty feet, and I've had to you know do habitat surveys through massive stands of this before, and it's 
it's a whole other world when you get into this stand that's you know 15 to 20 feet tall of just this Phragmites stand it is pretty impressive um unfortunately there's a european subspecies that is quite invasive we do have um a north american subspecies but it is not nearly as aggressive um as the european subspecies so it's considered an invasive species in north america the invasive the, the invasive european one is and it can take over um you know growing these massive monoculture stands it um, often colonizes ditches because it is incredibly salt tolerant so that can be um you know often seen especially back east we don't have a ton of this on the prairies that i've noticed but especially back east if you're driving around in the ditches and you see these kind of long feathery looking grasses that's your phragmites there and they're I, it's too bad because it's quite a beautiful grass but there's a lot less native species that use this and it it will overtake um various stretches of of wetlands and i know around long point there's been a lot of work done to try to remove a bunch of the phragmites and it's a you know it's a bit of a uphill battle for the most part but that is um a really tall grass species that is a wetland plant as well We also have lots of duckweeds, especially in those deeper water wetlands, so those class four, or class five, those open water, deep water wetlands. Um, duckweed is really neat in that they've got these itty bitty teeny tiny leaves, two to three leaves. They can create these great big floating mats. Um, they do have flowers, but they're really tiny and essentially not visible. Um, if you want to get out a hand lens and you see them at the right time, you can see these itty bitty flowers that come out along the side of the plant. Um, they like still water because they make this nice mat and they can form quite a dense cover. There's a few species. Um, oh, I'm forgetting the Latin name. <laughs> um, there's this common one and then there's the Triselca, which is kind of the three-leaved um, duckweed. But they make these lovely mats and they're, you know, fodder for a lot of wetland um, critters. You know, the they're, they're quite nutritious little plants. And of course, we have the true sedges, the Carex sedges. These are the Carex species. They're quite grass-like, but they have firm ridges along the leaves, and they're, the leaves themselves are quite firm and rough. They generally have a nice triangular little stem, and they grow to about one to three feet. Um, these Carex sedges are unique in that their fruits form this kind of puffy sack around um, the little nutlet. So you can see these nice little, it, if you squish them, they're, they're a little bit puffy. Um, you'll find them in shallow water and wet meadows. And the thing that usually, you know, people who are learning wetland plants um, identification, usually you'll go with the mnemonic sedges have edges. So the leaves really have this kind of edged appearance, almost like a, a W shape. So there's, the ridges are quite prominent. They're quite stiff in the leaves. They don't feel like a grass so much. They really have this kind of firmness to the to the leaves. You can see a little bit of those edges here in the photos. They come in various shapes and sizes, but they all have that kind of puffy sack um, around the little nutlet fruit. Those are your Carex species. We have rushes, which are similar to the bulrushes we talked about earlier, but essentially they're, they're bulrushes on a much smaller scale. They're dark green, they're round in cross-section, they're pretty wiry feeling. They have a, a single spiked stalk and they have a few short leaves around the edges. They're mostly, you know, clasping sheath leaves. They have beautiful flowers if you catch them in bloom um, near the tip of the stem. And you'll find these more in, in moist soil habitats, not so much the, the deeper wetlands, just kind of that wet meadow, moist soil areas. And they do resemble little bulrushes. Um, I've heard them referred to as round grasses by ranchers um, who you know are dealing with semi-flooded fields in their area. So, um, you know, very, very wiry, very round in cross section. Those are our rushes, the junkus species. And last but not least, we have spike rushes. They're also going to be fairly round in cross section, and they have their little flowers right at the tip. So you can think of it like, you know, like a little spear, a little spike. Um, they grow up to three feet tall, but I find they're generally a little bit shorter than that, usually about knee height, um, often in shallow and 
shallow wetlands and wet meadows. They'll they'll tolerate you know wetter feet than some of the junk as well. So you'll often see these in this you know a couple of inches of water, and they'll sometimes form these quite extensive little little mats of these spike rushes. I think the spike rushes are adorable. And if you take a look um, at this photo from a distance. We we're talking about some of these deeper water plants. You can see these cattails here in the foreground, these kind of green leafy plants. You can see some of last year's um, cattails growing on them. This new season's growth isn't quite at the, the stage where they're putting up those, um, you know, corn dog looking flowers, but all of the older ones from last year are still visible there. Further in the background, we have a couple of stands of bulrushes, and you can just see how much you know, darker and richer green they are in comparison to the nearby cattails. They're very, very dark green. And in the foreground, we do have a little bit of sedges there. So that's just a quick, quick and dirty overview of some of the wetland plants. I'm sure a whole um, course could be done on just wetland plants by themselves. But, you know, I thought it was a great idea because Somebody had mentioned, are we going to do wetland plants? And I do mention a lot of them. So these are kind of a bit more of the common ones. Of course, there's lots of other ones that you'll see out there, but this should give you an idea for kind of more of the emergent vegetation that you're likely to see poking out. Okay, we can quickly review some of those bird sounds for today. Northern pintail had that kind of toot and zipper noises. Oh, uh, that clicked to next one. There we go. Again, it has that nice pintail, and the drake has those lovely white spurs on the side of the neck on that plain kind of brownish face. The American coot is our friendly little, <laughs> friendly water chicken, very, um, you know, very duck-like for a rail species. So lots of popping, raspy calls. All right, we've got our two grebe species, the rednecked grebe and the pieville grebe. Do the rednecked grebes kind of whinnying, braying first? And again, those kind of silvery cheek patches is really what stands out at a distance. That and it's a, a large dark grebe with a very long bill. Pie bill grebe, again, uh, more often heard than seen. Does this loud owl hoop call? Also the hyena call. <laughs> really does sound like a laughing hyena. <laughs> and you'll often get two birds doing this, um, one starting and the other joining in afterwards. We have our shorebirds for the day. The killdeer is one of the ones that you'll want to focus on learning the call for, and it's also where it gets its name and they're very noisy. Next we have the American Avocet, little pleek, pleek, pleek calls. And our black neck silt, doing a little bit of a yap, 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 but again, these last two species, the avocet and the stilt, you'll you'll see them, and that's generally going to be how you're going to encounter and identify these two species. But our yap 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 calls of the stilt. Still good to be familiar with. 
And last but not least, our leopard frog with those kind of leopard-like spots or <laughs> the solar eclipse type spots could be quite topical. All right, sounds like rubbing a few balloons together or your stomach grumbling. And that's it for this evening. Um, here's my contact information. You can feel free to reach out at any time. Um, you can visit the Marshwatch website at birdscanada.org slash birdscience slash marshwatch. If you want to take a look at any of the quizzes that we have on offer, the ones that we're not doing during the webinar, um, you can also find last year's presentation materials. Um, I put up the webinars about 24 to 48 hours after doing them. So if you want to revisit any of the information or share it with a friend, you can go ahead and do that. You can also uh, find Birds Canada on all of the socials or visit our website. Um, we are a charitable not-for-profit. So if you you know like this kind of programming and you want to consider making a donation, I'd encourage you to, to go ahead and do that. It's always very welcome. Otherwise, we have, you know, a couple of fantastic supporters of the programming called Marsh Watch. So we have the Manitoba Fish and Wildlife Enhancement Fund, the Government of Canada, Saskatchewan's Ministry of Environments, Fish and Wildlife and Fish and Wildlife Development Fund, Sask Power, and the Wildlife ha Wildlife Habitat Canada. <laughs> Ooh, I'm stumbling through that one. 